Hello, I am Al Carter, Executive Director of the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy. As a 120-year-old nonprofit association with a mission to protect public health, NABP has seen many changes and advances in healthcare over the years. But there are some aspects that need further improvement. Research has shown that life expectancy and health outcomes for racial and ethnic minority populations, particularly black Americans, are significantly worse than they are for white Americans. It has also been shown that patients in racial and ethnic minority groups tend to experience greater satisfaction and better outcomes when treated by healthcare providers with a similar racial ethnic background. Unfortunately, the percentage of pharmacists in racial ethnic minority groups is much lower than that of minoritized individuals in the general population. As a pharmacist myself, I recognize that the heart of pharmacy practice is caring for patients. To provide the best care, it is important to see our patients as individuals with unique circumstances and backgrounds that play a role in their general health and well-being, as well as their medication therapy. This approach, sometimes called person-centered care, acknowledges diversity, fosters equity, and creates an inclusive environment for patients of all backgrounds. Person-centered care recognizes that patients are individuals with rights, knowledge, and lived experience that extend beyond their disease, illness, and treatment. Factors including and related to race and ethnicity are inevitably linked to an individual's experience. NABP created this continuing education program to raise awareness among pharmacy professionals about the significance of race and ethnicity in person-centered care. Pharmacists are well positioned to recognize and address such factors and their effects on health outcomes when counseling individuals. Through knowledge and empathy, pharmacy professionals can improve the care and ultimately the outcomes of patients in minoritized populations. NABP is committed to furthering racial and ethnic diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, at all levels of healthcare. This program is NABP's capstone achievement in a multi-stakeholder project titled Eliminating Generational Racial Health Disparities, funded by the Office of Minority Health of the United States Department of Health and Human Services. The program brings together a distinguished group of experts who will share their experience and insights. To start, you will hear an interview with a panel of pharmacy leaders on the concept of person-centered care and its connection with DEI in the practice of pharmacy. Next, you will learn from experts about related factors such as social determinants of health, cultural humility and diversity in the pharmacy workforce pipeline. You will hear from me again at the end of the video to wrap things up. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome today to our panel on person-centered care. Today we'll discuss the concept of person-centered care and its connection with diversity, equity, and inclusion in the practice of pharmacy. I have with me three esteemed panelists who I'd like to introduce at this point. First is Dr. Elisa Bernstein. Elisa is the Senior Vice President of Practice, Policy, and Partnerships for the American Pharmacists Association. Welcome, Elisa. Thanks for having me here. Next, I have Dr. Frank North. Frank is a president of the National Pharmaceutical Association and instructional assistant professor at Randhill School of Pharmacy, Texas A&M University, HSC. Welcome, Frank. Thank you for having me as well. Finally, I have Dr. Rhonda Marie Chikolis. Rhonda is a president of the Minnesota Board of Pharmacy, a clinical pharmacist, and a community advocate. Welcome, Rhonda. It's a pleasure to be here, thank you. Let's get started. So first is a question is gonna to go to you, Lisa. What is meant by the term person-centered care, and how is it distinguished from patient-centered care? So, good question. Um, oftentimes, those are actually used interchangeable, but they have different meanings. So, patient-centered care, which is a term that we've been using in pharmacy for decades and in the healthcare community, is focusing on where the pharmacist recognizes the patient with their drug therapy and the health outcomes that you're looking for. So looking for the patient 
and talking with them about their concerns about their therapy and making sure that they understand what's needed. And so it's really focusing on that person as a patient. Person-centered care is looking at the whole person. It's looking at not just their, their rights, their expectations, or the situations that they bring from the world around them. And like, for example, looking at what else is impacting that patient, looking at social determinants of health, looking at barriers to care. For example, a person with homelessness, with food insecurity, with um, other types of safety issues. Those all bring different aspects to how you look at that person. For example, if it's a person with homelessness, you're not going to provide them with a medication that needs refrigeration. They may not be able to have that. If it's a person with food insecurity, with diabetes, their nutrition is very important and what they eat is very important to control their diabetes. And so if they can't get nutritious foods, that can impact how you care for that person as a whole. And for the patient care process, which students now learn that in pharmacy school, it was developed by the pharmacy community. It's focused on the patient-centered care. It's kind of old school now because with the difference in the shift to person-centered care, there's an effort underway to actually change that so that patients, their pharmacy students, will now start learning about the person-centered care focus. Because it isn't really just all about the disease and just the disease. It's about everything that's contributing to that, all the environmental factors, the social determinants, and what have you. Yeah, the world around you impacts the, the person, not just the focus on their health, yeah. per se. Rhonda Frank, anything else to add to that? I really like the concept and the shift of looking towards the person as a whole. And a lot of times when we're in this field, we're very comfortable with using catchphrases like social determinants of health, clinical guidelines, clinical algorithms. What I like about the person-centered approach is that it actually moves from a state of saying that we're empowering patients, which we don't empower patients. Patients have the power within. We're helping build capacity. We're helping increase knowledge base. We're helping connect people to the resources um, that they need to be well in the best version of themselves. Now, sometimes that might be challenging because we don't see movement towards those lovely clinical markers that we're so comfortable with. But again, um, meeting people where they're at is so critical to achieving positive health outcomes. And I agree with that. You know, I think when you think about uh, Schumann's model, there are phases of how uh, an individual may see themselves along uh, their illness phases is that a person has to um, identify themselves as having a disease state or having a particular uh, thought process where they need to get help and identify themselves in the patient role. And I think having a person-centered model really says that regardless of whether or not we're going to stigmatize what, what your presentations may be or not, you are a person and so we want to engage with you in that way. So it's taking away the stigma centered around uh, becoming a patient or having to uh, give up yourself in, in a sense to, to a healthcare provider or different things of that nature. It really levels the playing field. So I appreciate the things that were said about um, making sure that we're centering on the person. And I'll tell you, I've been a part of some conversations where we're having those conversations uh, with respect to when the patient is an animal, right, or a furry family member for individuals, but we're still placing that caregiver, the owner of that particular uh, fur baby or the parent to that fur baby as someone that we're talking to outside of the patient role, but just what are the what are the expectations that they have for uh, their fur babies in, in terms of um, the quality of life that they want them to have as opposed to um, the stigmatization of being a, uh, identified as a patient. Great, gotcha. Thank you all for that explanation. I think now that we have settled a definition of what person-centered care is, uh, Dr. Chikolis, I'm gonna ask this next question to you. Why do you think it is important in the practice of pharmacy and how does this relate to health outcomes? Um, will you share your thoughts with us? That's a wonderful question. Thank you for that question. I think, first of all, it's important to look at what's contained in your question. The first things are practice of pharmacy. Pharmacy is driven a lot by guidelines. We're very comfortable with them. We have treatment algorithms. But again, it is a practice and an art, which takes us back to the notion of 
why we need person-centered care, and the fact that there are a lot of variables that can affect those clinical outcomes. The other thing is the definition of health outcomes, right? Health outcomes looks at an intervention and getting a result. Traditionally, I think we're very comfortable with looking at maybe a change in blood pressure, a change in A1C, a change in weight, instead of looking at a change in patient satisfaction, a change in patient autonomy, a change in a patient even buying into that they have a medical condition and being able to share that medical condition with their family members and really looking at it from a holistic approach. So the failure for us to do that in pharmacy will result in decreased medication adherence, diminished patient experience, and also ultimately result in increased healthcare expenses. Pharmacy definitely needs to make that shift. Mm -hmm. It is continued importance that we address this, not just from a personal standpoint, not just from a practitioner standpoint, but systemically uh, via policies and practices. Thank you, Rhonda. Frank or Elisa, anything you'd like to add? When we look at these from these perspectives in our healthcare system, it gives the patient an opportunity and an easy access to opt out of certain things. And I think when we when we think about social determinants of health, and I heard another speaker, they're really not determinants, they're really drivers. I've kind of coined a uh, pile, so like a, a pile of clothes, P-I-L-E, which is predictors of inequalities through lived experiences or from lived experiences. They really, again, take us back to the person and the things that they may have experienced or the things that may have been um, assigned to them at birth that allows for them to navigate the system a little bit differently than, than others within the resources that may, that, that may be provided to them uh, through their life in terms of like the determinants or the drivers of health. So I think when we, again, identify the, the person and the traumas that they may be going through or the, that they may have experienced, then it gives us the opportunity to have them opt in to more of the conversation about the quality of care and how they want to be perceived and what they want out of the outcome. You know, I, I talk to a lot of to, to a lot of students, high school or, or whatnot, and I always try to finish the sentence that we always say when we say, oh, I like to meet a person where, where they are. What happens when you meet a person where they are, right? So often we try to get them where we want them to go. And so as pharmacists and other healthcare providers, we are trying to get patients where we want them to go as opposed to helping them get to where they want to go. So when we think about putting some of our thought processes in about motivational interviewing and different things of that nature, it's helping a patient, it's meeting that person where they are and helping them get to where they want to go. And then hopefully once they get to that particular point, then we can encourage them and motivate them to move a step further. So I, I think, you know, we're experiencing a person that it may be presenting as a patient, but then we're treating them as a person as opposed to the patient by focusing on their disease states as opposed to focusing on them as a whole person. And just to add to that, and you, you talked about the resources for the patient, but in order to be successful, which is your, your question in, in terms of the outcomes, pharma, pharmacists are busy. Pharmacy teams right now are really busy. And so they need the appropriate resources to be able to take the time to the, the shift to a, a person-centered care is going to take a lot longer in, in terms of talking with that, that person and finding out more about their situation. And right now, the, you know, the incentives and the resources aren't there in order for pharmacists to be able to take the time that's needed to really make that successful for their health outcomes. Right. And one of the other great things, and as we think about this, and this is prefacing my next question for you, Dr. North, as pharmacists, we go into their communities in many different situations and many different setups. So we see what type of environment that they live in and, and what they're exposed to and some of those environmental factors by just merely stepping into their into that community pharmacy um, and into that setting. And so it gives a better understanding of what these patients are dealing with as we look at this person-centered pharmacy. And so it's always something that people don't think about as pharmacists when we go into that space. But Frank, can you help us understand how race and ethnicity factor into person-centered pharmacy care in the community pharmacy setting and in the health system pharmacy setting? 
Sure. I think, you know, when we think about race and ethnicity, the first thing we have to do is really do what I'm an advocate for, and that's disaggregating the data, right? And disaggregating terms and not allowing a buzzword to really kind of represent the whole. And so I think the first thing we have to do is recognize that race and ethnicity are two different things, right? And so we often hear them put together, and so then we think that maybe that's one characteristic in a person. An example of that is uh, I am Black but I am African-American, right? So my race is black, but I am born here in America. So my ethnicity and my culture, my cultural values are synonymous with being born and growing up in America comparative to um, a black person who may have closer generational ties to the continent of Africa. They have different beliefs and different things of that nature. So ethnicity and ethnicity is really beyond the place of origin. It could be religion, or whatever the cultural norms are of a particular group. And so when we look at that, we have to identify that there's research that shows patients that have racial concordance, so are cared for by a person who looks like them will have better outcomes. But what if there's some discordance with the ethnicity or the place that that person comes from? And so I think when we look at a person and we have to look at all of those factors that are beyond the disease state that the person uh, may have um, to determine what may be beneficial for them. So you can present as black race, but then your ethnicity in terms of your religion might be Muslim. And so you might practice uh, different um, religious beliefs that may have a, a, a barrier or a challenge to some of the, uh, the treatment options that you are not attaching to that particular person just based off of how they look from race. And so I think it's important for us to really, one, identify that and not just rest on the laurels that if we increase the number of certain groups of individuals that it helps, but how can we get providers to understand and to respect all of the what a person brings to the table, regardless of what that uh, coordinates is to the patient. So I think one big way is to look at how we disaggregate the data. So when you, again, look at, and I often kind of talk about myself because it's the only thing that I know that's true is, you know, if I say something about someone else, they'll say, that, you know, they'll say the opposite, right? But, you know, so again, when you look at, again, the, the U.S. Census data and how they categorize race and ethnicity, it's really putting a multitude of groups under one group. So I think it's really about us looking at how we disaggregate the data and how we ask, like, the hard questions. So, uh, you know, there's Dr. Jam, uh, Dr. Jacinda abdul Matuk. Mathukabir, who is doing a lot of research about how even the numbers that we see when we look at disparity numbers and when we look at prevalence of things of that nature might be skewed because the group that we're looking at may not have access or may not be e even engaged in that particular population. So what, what are we missing when we're looking at that conversation? We always have to be looking at who's in the room and more importantly, asking like, and who's not in the room? And then more importantly to that, why are those individuals not in the room? Why are they not a part of the conversation? And that's not to point the finger at anyone to say that you did a bad job to exclude someone from the conversation, but to do the work of how do we include individuals so we can hear all voices, so we can move forward toward the expected outcomes that that person that is in the patient role wants to see in themselves. Just to add, you know, uh... I agree with everything you said. If you look at the where pharmacy is now in the community pharmacy setting with pharmacists moving, pharmacists moving around, pharmacists leaving, the pharmacist in many communities does not necessarily represent the people in that community. So a lot more needs to be done in order to really a, a deliberate attempt to really understand and get that cultural competency of the community, make sure that you are able to speak the language if, it, if there's a language barrier and really overcome some of those barriers that come with um, being different or not necessarily representing the patients that and the people that are in your community. I think that's something that that's not done enough Mm -hmm. in in the practice of pharmacy in the communities. I think all of those are excellent points, but I also would like to add, um, too often in the literature and when we're trained as pharmacists, we look at different characteristics as risk factors. Um, we tend to risk stratify people based on race, based on ethnicity, based on zip code, based on gender, based on a, a number of variables. Personally, in, in my practice, what I try to do is look at um, areas of opportunity 
or protective factors. So, for example, um, I grew up in a, the city of North Minneapolis, born and raised there. I made an intentional choice to stay there, to be connected to my community. But again, the protective factor for me is I've had a rich history of clinicians, um, of people who are very vested in the community, and so often those things are overlooked. So I think when we're training people and when we're having this conversation, we need to shift our mindset to really look at those areas of opportunity and protective factors. It's very true. I never even thought about it in that way until you said that, Rhonda. Um, so thank you. We have one last question, and I will address this last question to the three of you to, to answer in turn. Uh, Elisa, what can be done or is being done to increase sensitivity to race and ethnicity in pharmacy practice? Well, more is needed. So there, there is some being done, but wait, more is needed. You know, even for my, in my state, for when I get, renew my license, they're now requiring implicit bias training. And I know more, more and more states it's required. Mm -hmm. That's a small step, but there, there is more, and it's not across the country. Where, where it's required about three years ago, and I know you were you were part of this, the pharmacy organizations, and I think you, you all were, were part of this too, the pharmacy organizations at a national level got together and said, you know, we need to look at racial and health equity situation in this country and put out a joint statement really calling for more is needed for racial injustice, but also ensuring that there is more equity in healthcare from pharmacy and increasing awareness, working together for education at the school and in the, the practicing in the pharmacy teams. That came out three years ago. There's been a little bit, but there's a lot more that's needed. At, at APHA, we have two task force. One's that's looking internally at DEI in the pharmacy profession, or internally at, at APHA, but then one externally at DEIB in the profession across and really making sure that DEI and equity is becomes the fabric mm -hmm. of our profession and baby steps, but baby steps. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's it's great, right? But I think also there we've seen, unfortunately, some regression in the work that we've done. And, and I think again, we have to disaggregate like what things mean, right? And so we've seen a push for making diversity, equity, and inclusion more performative or more proverbial. So then there's a lot of negativity centered around what diversity, equity, and inclusion is and how it should be implemented. I uh, was struggling with how to contend with that um, in, in, in the work that I do uh, because it's not just diversity for the sake of diversity, it's diversity for the sake of having representation and having the ability to have all persons' voices heard. And so, you know, I was thinking about just what, is, what does it mean to show up in a holistic representative, representative way? Um, and then I was uh, on uh, listening to a webinar and uh, Dr. Nicole Avant talked about uh, some literature that she read about radical love. And I did some uh, work with my institution with the Clarion competition. It was through the University of Minnesota. One of the competition uh, topics centered around the book uh, Radical Belonging by Linda Bacon. And so uh, hearing that and learning about that and then seeing this radical love come up when we were having a conversation about uh, HIV and, and in the HIV epidemic from Dr. Avant, focus my attention on this word radical and what is it and what is it and how is it different from uh, proverbial stances, right? And so it's about having radical representation. So again, always at the fundamental level, asking the question why and how we can be better, I think is, is how we move forward. And I think there are groups like my organization, the National Pharmaceutical Association, you know, we're committed to not just working in our silos, but we work along with APHA, uh, American Pharmacists Association and other organizations to really ho hopefully help develop policy statements and position statements, but even beyond that, like action and ra radical actions that's gonna really move the, the needle on the conversation just beyond a conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion, because I want to be there because I have a voice and I'm going to be heard. I want to not say, hey, you're included, but I want to feel included, you know, when I just show up. And I think these are things that happen in less of a performative way than not. And I think we were doing some, we had some great strides. All things are political. And then, you know, unfortunately we had some hyperpolarization there, but it, it requires pharmacists and pharmacists provide an agency for patients and all people to, to stand up 
to be involved in your professional organizations at the local level, at the national level, and how it looks in terms of how you're represented. So, you know, I'm involved in my state association, despite some of the experiences that I may have, I continue to show up. I show up in federal or national associations like American Pharmacists Association, like uh, American Society of Health Systems Pharmacists. So those are things that how I stay grounded. But then from a cultural representative standpoint, I'm involved in the National Pharmaceutical Association that I think helps amplify those voices and then help to create the courage or the opportunity to share that within larger organizations. We have to be able to do those things to, to move the needle. And so while I think that we were on track to doing that. I have to be honest that there's been some regression, but it takes for us all to understand that and be radical about the why, and more importantly, how do we shift back on the course of doing the great work that we were doing three years ago, as was mentioned. Dr. North, that was f fabulous. So thank you for sharing the, the term radical. Like, I'm a big person on linguistics, right? So a lot of times um, when I was trained, I was always told we need data, we need the evidence, um, we have to have that. And then I was also told that, you know, it might take 10 years to put something into practice. I personally refused to accept that. And I wanted to go back to the your point about who's in the room and who's driving the conversation. Um, a lot of times when we're having these conversations around person-centered care, diversity, equity, and inclusion, we are not bringing the subject matter experts to the table, and that is the community, the people who we, we are designed to serve, not to service. Um, there's, a, there's a huge difference when you're a servant leader versus providing a service. Um, again, it is important that we continue to train people who are reflective of the community. We know what the outcomes and data say. Again, we might not see a change in blood pressure or we might not see that, that magical change in an A1C immediately, but it is the long-term um, benefits that we'll see. The other thing is really we have to get back to relationship building. I think the reason why we see the shift to the term person-centered care is it's about relationships. It's not just with the, the person or the individual receiving care, it's about their family, their, their church, the community at large. And so in order to see movement, we're gonna have to go back to the basics and really work on those relationship building. But very much so, we do need to look at policy in meaningful change. I think it's great we continue to have task force. Um, I think we have a lot of data and evidence that supports a lot of these initiatives. But now I am going to say, I think it's time for us to be radical and really put things into action. We have the evidence, we have programming, we've seen things over and over and over again, but it's time to give it a chance. No, we're not going to be perfect. I think our perfectionism and desire to always be right and liked sometimes hinders our ability to actually go out there and do the work. And so I personally am committed to helping to advance the work and I am looking forward to meaningful change. That doesn't mean it's gonna be easy, but I know it can be done, especially when I'm in the room with the likes of you all and um, just honored to be a part of that change. So I get servant leadership, be radical, and collaboration through a united voice. And that's how we solve all the world's problems, right? Or at least start. Or at least start, <laughs> there we go. One lasting thought, if you could share with the audience that is watching this, that focuses on the topic of person-centered care and its connection with DEI and the practice of pharmacy, what would that last thought be? I wanna add another item to your list here. Oh, so we've got four. Yeah, right. I, I think it's sustainability. We need to get to a place where there's sustainability. There are pockets of innovative care happening around the country where pharmacists are working with in transforming their community, working with community social workers, where pharmacy technicians are being trained as, as community social workers, really working to focus on that person-centered care and bring that together. But that's pockets. Mm -hmm. It needs to be scaled up. It needs to be, as I said before, there needs to be the appropriate incentives in order to provide those resources or payment for some of these are services that are provided and there needs to be a recognition by payers in order to pay for those services so that pharmacists and pharmacy teams and 
social community social workers can work together in order to drive this care. And, I, and, I, and one more thing is, as I mentioned earlier, that the patient care process is going to be changing from patient care to person-centered care. And I think that will then create this next generation of pharmacists that it's ingrained in their fabric, but now we've got to change that dynamic and be radical in order to change the practicing pharmacists into that space as well. I think that was well said. I think you know, the big thing is, again, understanding and identifying that no one person or, or one person's group is a monolith or is monolithic. And I think it's important for us to, again, you know, dare I say again, really disaggregate the data and be radical in how we're asking questions about how we're showing up and how we're allowing other individuals to show up when it comes to this radical representation that we're talking about um, in healthcare. And that's even beyond Patients. As pharmacists, there are a lot of things that's going on within the workspace in terms of like the workplace environment, the safety and different things of that nature. And so we need that radical representation as well at the table, right, at the conversation so we can, again, hear from those representatives and di hear different perspectives. And then we can start developing a critical mass where we have well representation of different groups of different bodies. So I always, you know, share interestingly, I am, you know, one of four children from the same mother and the same father, but each of my siblings and I are uniquely different. And that is what our patient population looks like. And so this person, again, arrives to you as a patient. It is our responsibility to put the human back in them and give them person-centered care that helps them get to where they want to go because then that builds trust, that builds faith, that builds a relationship that then helps get them to the next level. And then hopefully one of those levels is where you ultimately wanted to see them, but it allowed for them to get there in a respectful way based on their particular um, achievements and milestones that they want to see for themselves. Very well said, Bible. I would just also like to use this opportunity to really say, like, too often we don't see the hidden treasures or the hidden value in connecting DE&I and um, uh, person-centered care. Patients are people mentor me. They pour into me. Having that framework or having that knowledge base and, again, remembering that these individuals are the subject matter experts of their condition, their bodies, and they have the power and capacity to move the needle. Again, the failure to not do this is we're going to continue to see what we see. We're going to see increased emergency room visits. We're going to see poor medication adherence. We're going to see incidents of HIV infectious disease increase in the community. And so again, it is imperative that we buy into this. It is imperative that we train people who are reflective of communities, but not just reflective of communities. And so we all have to be vested in these initiatives. It's been wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been great. Dr. Bernstein, Dr. North, Dr. Chikolas. Thank you so much for your thoughts and for your insights today. I know that our audience has benefited from this tremendously. I have as well. I think we have our marching orders. Be radical. We do. We know we need to move forward. We have the initiative and we have to be radical. So thank you again. And this brings the first portion of our program to a close. Thank you. I'm so excited that you're joining me today. I'm Dr. Robert E. Braylock, and I serve as president of Release Heaven on Earth and principal and chief operating officer of BHK Consulting. Today, we'll discuss Black, Indigenous, and people of color, social determinants of health, and the U.S. healthcare system. Let's get started. These are the five central questions that we'll be covering during our time together. As I mentioned, we're focusing on social determinants of health, black, indigenous, and people of color, and the U.S. healthcare system. In addition, previously, my colleagues focused on person-centered care. So we'll take a more detailed look at how the social determinants of health, including race and ethnicity, intersect with person-centered care. The World Health Organization defines social determinants of health as the non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. They are the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, 
and the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. These forces and systems include economic policies and systems, development agendas, social norms, social policies, and political systems. So as you can imagine, and as you're thinking, yes, this does impact the health and wellness of both individuals and communities. As I mentioned earlier, my colleagues, Dr. Chikolis, Dr. North, Dr. Bernstein, and Dr. Carter engaged a conversation around person-centered care. I thank them so much for that conversation, and I hope that you learned a lot from it. As a reminder, person-centered care is defined as holistic, empowering care that tailors support according to the individual's priorities and needs. This is not a do as I say healthcare provider to patient relationship, but rather a joint collaboration between the provider and the individual person, or as my colleagues at Dartmouth refer to it, co-production. Throughout this session, we will consider a middle-aged migrant worker who currently experiences type two diabetes mellitus. We will see how language, location, transportation, work schedule, food, and housing all contribute to his health and wellness. Currently within the United States, black and brown people experience worse outcomes than white folks. Some of the most disturbing and demonstrative evidence of this is seen within education, employment, housing, and economics. Let's take a more detailed look at this. The following chart is from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics Current Population Survey, and it shows the 2022 annual average educational attainment for the labor force, broken down and disaggregated by race and ethnicity. Two areas that likely stick out to you are the gray bars, representing a bachelor's degree and higher, and the dark blue bars, representing less than a high school diploma. This chart shows that for white folks, the share of the labor force with the bachelor's degree and higher was 44%, compared to 34% for black people and 25% for people of Hispanic or Latino descent. Looking further, we see that for folks of Hispanic and Latino descent, the share of the labor force with less than a high school diploma is 20%. This is remarkable in comparison to the other groups that are each 6% or less in this specific educational category. In other words, within the U.S. labor force in 2022, for those who were 25 years of age and older, people of Hispanic and Latino descent were more than three times likely to have less than a high school diploma than white people, black people, and Asian people. This is highly problematic. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics states that higher levels of educational attainment are generally associated with a greater likelihood of employment and a lower likelihood of unemployment. For all major race and ethnicity groups except Asians, jobless rates for people with a bachelor's degree and higher were lower than the rates for those with lower levels of educational attainment. Individuals with higher levels of education are also more likely to be employed in higher paying jobs, such as those in management, professional, and related occupations, than are individuals with less education. For example, median earnings of people 25 years and older increased with educational attainment across all the major race and ethnicity groups. You may also be questioning why Asian folks are excelling and black people are not? That's a great question. I highly encourage you to begin learning about the model minority myth and also to review Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s 1967 interview at the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia with NBC News correspondent Sander Venokur. Sticking with the data set from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics Current Population Survey, this next chart shows the 2022 annual average employment categories for the labor force, again, broken down by race and ethnicity. The two areas that I wanna call your attention to are the dark blue bars representing the occupational category of management, professional and related, and the mustard yellow bars representing the occupational category of natural resources, construction and maintenance. In 2022, 
58% of employed Asians worked in management, professional, and related occupations, the highest paying major occupational category, compared with 43% of employed whites, 35% of employed blacks, and 25% of employed Hispanics. Looking further at the data, we see that for people of Hispanic and Latino descent, 17% of them worked in natural resources, construction, and maintenance occupations, compared with only 10% of whites, 5% of blacks, and 3% of Asians. What do we know about jobs in this occupational category, generally speaking? Often, they pay less than jobs in other occupational categories. In the next chart, the U.S. Census Bureau displays data from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis that captures nearly 30 years of home ownership data broken down by race and ethnicity. The blue line represents white people, the orange line represents black people, the gray line represents people of Hispanic and Latino descent, regardless of race, and the mustard yellow line represents people who are Asian, Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, and American Indian or Alaska Native, and those who report two or more races. While the chart speaks for itself, the U.S. Department of the Treasury provides relevant context in their commentary, saying the black-white gap in home ownership rates was the same in 2020 as it was in 1970, just two years after the passage of the Fair Housing Act of 1968, which interestingly enough, sought to end racial discrimination in the housing market. The final chart that we'll look at reflects data from the U.S. Census Bureau over a 40-year period and it shows the median household income broken down by race and ethnicity. Similar to the previous slide, the data speaks for itself. The median household income for blacks is less than half that of whites. And again, this is over a 40 year period. We've just examined educational, employment, housing, and economic outcomes for black and brown people compared to that of white people. Let's see how this is relevant to person-centered care. As you may recall from earlier in the presentation, we're going to focus on a middle-aged migrant worker who's currently experiencing type 2 diabetes mellitus. And we'll look at several factors that intersect and interact with his experiences within the pharmacy. So how do social determinants of health influence patient outcomes? When we consider this middle-aged migrant worker, Let's also consider that he's a non-native English speaker. There's a wealth of research and data that shows that when patients interact with healthcare providers that do not speak the same language as they do, their outcomes tend to be worse, and that when patients do have healthcare providers who speak the same language as they do, their outcomes tend to be better. So assuming that this patient's language is different than that of the pharmacy staff and the pharmacists that he's working with, we can understand how language may present a barrier in the pharmacist and patient interaction. The next factor that we'll look at is location. While there are many pharmacies on nearly every corner throughout the country, we also realize that in certain parts of the country, in certain parts of our states, that there are large areas that do not have pharmacies at all. Again, Assuming that this middle-aged migrant worker lives in a rural community where he may not have access to a pharmacy within 10, 15, maybe even 30 minutes of him, we can see how that poses a barrier and could prevent access to services that are vitally important for this gentleman. Transportation is the next factor that we'll look at. And while many pharmacies have implemented delivery services and even prescriptions are able to be mailed, if an individual needs a vaccine, this is something that generally has to take place within the pharmacy. Again, this presents a barrier. Work schedule is another factor that can influence patient outcomes. Within pharmacy, we tend to say things like a patient is non-adherent without really considering the external circumstances that the patient is engaging. Let's look at the patient's work schedule and how it influences patient outcomes. Assuming that this person works on a farm he may not have the opportunity to administer an injectable medication two to three times daily. We can see how this could potentially influence outcomes and lead to inadherence. Another social determinant of health that our patient could be experiencing is access to quality food. Food insecurity affects far too many people who live in the United States. Assuming that this patient lives in a rural community that may only have one grocery store, 
that may only have certain types of food that don't necessarily fit this patient's diet, this could also pose a significant barrier to the patient's health and wellness journey. Housing is the last factor that we'll look at in this example. If the patient lives on a farm, it's highly likely that there are pesticides, ragweed, pollen, and other things that may aggravate the patient's allergies. Considering that the patient has type 2 diabetes, we understand that if the patient gets sick, that this can trigger and influence the patient's insulin levels and their blood glucose. This, again, poses a potential barrier to the patient experiencing good health and wellness. These several factors are a prime example of how social determinants of health can influence the patient's outcomes. Now let's examine how understanding social determinants of health can have a positive impact on our patients. Language. If we can provide translation services to this patient, we should expect that this will help to improve adherence to the medications and to decrease the misutilization of the medication. Looking at location and transportation, if we're able to implement mobile clinics and or delivery services, this may have a positive impact on the health and wellness of the patient. Considering the patient's work schedule of 10 to 12 hour days, we can utilize a pill box and we can also simplify his dosing regimen. For food, let's consider a culturally relevant diet recommendation. We want things that are easy for the patient to cook and we also want things that the patient enjoys eating. And last but not least, to combat the irritants that the patient is experiencing, we can recommend air purifiers and or masks. These are several ways that we can help to influence patients' outcomes in a positive way. By having a better understanding of social determinants of health, we're able to provide better person-centered care. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm Dr. Leela Ellis Nelson, co-owner and founder of Changing Perspectives, a justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion firm. I'm also the director for the Illinois Center for Education Equity at Chicago State University and adjunct faculty member and dissertation chair at Roosevelt University. I became interested in DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion. I also like to add the J in there, which is justice, because without restorative justice, you can't truly engage in the work in a more intentional way. But that journey started when I was about eight years old. So when I was living in Georgia, Riverdale, Georgia, to be specific, I was on the gymnastics team. And at a meet that we went to in particular, I injured myself on the balance beam. The beam broke. Unfortunately, a screw or nail went through the beam and impacted my foot. And and I noticed that there was no mobility or action from anyone outside of the families that came with my team and also our coach specifically. They immediately rushed over to check on me to make sure that I was okay. Again, I'm noticing no one else is moving in that space. A few moments later, another young lady was using the vault. She runs into it directly, smacks in front of it, gets the wind knocked out of her. They stopped the entire meet to ensure that she was okay. Again, something they should have done, right? When the child is injured, you run over to make sure that they are all right, that they're capable of moving forward, and that if you do need any additional medical attention, it can be rendered. So here I am at eight, noticing that there's this stark difference between my injury and this other young child's injury. The main difference, and really the only difference between the two of us, is that I was a dark-skinned black girl and this was a young white girl. So in the car ride home, my parents had the talk with me, the talk that most or many black and, of course, other persons of color's families often have with their kids. Because of how you look, because of how you identify, because of how you exist in the world, you will rarely receive some of the kindness that other people do. Most people will not stop and check on you. They will often assume you were the reason why these things have happened, and you will often sometimes be receiving the blame and some of the harm and that come with things that have nothing to do with you or your existence. So having that talk at eight years old put it in my mind that simply existing put me in a position to either be a threat or threatened by a world that's supposed to protect me and love me the way that I saw it do for someone else's baby. 
So my work centers on making sure that that little girl continues to be shown up for in a meaningful and intentional way. But in my big grown-up form, I get to do that for other people who don't have parents who can love on them or community members that can love on them. So the restor restoration part in terms of the justice and equity piece is how do we ensure that we are accountable for things that have happened. And then the DEI part, the diversity, equity, inclusion pieces, are how are we acknowledging this and actually doing the work to not only have a short-term impact, but a long-term impact for everybody else and their kids. It started with a car ride and it ended with a doctorate in clinical psychology. And now I have the big responsibility of raising a young black child in the world that still will not see him as the bright and charismatic and bubbly person that I see. And I have the role of allowing him the safety and the space to keep being that person while also being aware that some people will not come check on you. There's some fundamental differences between cultural sensitivity, cultural humility, cultural competence, but then there's also this piece around cultural awareness, right? Just this awareness that there are different people in the world around you who have different beliefs around religion. They have different sexual orientations, gender identities, racial ethnic backgrounds, all the different things that make you you. You will never meet your equal match in the world. Even identical twins are not the same person, regardless of how sometimes we like to think that they are, but that there's this awareness that there is this abundance of difference that people exist in. So then you transition over to this idea of what does it mean specifically to be culturally competent? Most people believe that cultural competence is actually the goal. I want to be fully competent in knowing everything I can about a specific culture. Again, I've been black for 37 years. I will never know everything there is to know about black people. I will never know everything there is to know about women. I will never know everything there is to know about people who are Baptist. So while competency is an uh, aspiration for many, it's not truly something that you could ever meet or match. Overall, you should be working towards cultural humility, which is just the recognition that there are so many unique differences that even in homogenous groups, and by homogeneity, I mean black people, people who are Baptist, people who are women, people who live in Chicago. There are these differences of how we engage with our culture and how we believe about ourselves and the world around us that it's okay to recognize I don't know what I don't know. And while, yes, there are some areas where there's lots of overlap, that's just where culture in itself comes from, this idea that we share parts of our history, we share parts of our traumas, we share parts of our achievements, and all those things help to really develop and better understand and situate us as this level of connection because we share some of these identity pieces. But in humility, we recognize that I will never know everything there is to know about you because you will never know everything there is to know about you. But I want to honor that. So when you're looking at this principle of what does cultural awareness and sensitivity and the, the humility of it all and the awareness of it all actually look like, they're all part of a larger umbrella. And the bigger goal is to honor people and to see them for who they are, including those parts of themselves that are different from you, but to also be intentional about the things that they and other people like them have gone through and how that impacts them and how they may need additional supports or resources or care in a way that you may not because you may have privilege in some areas where other people don't. And just to ensure that you're doing the best you can to learn about them as an individual, but also to leave room for them as a collective part of another community or multiple communities. We all have work to do. And we like to believe that, you know, because I even belong to a minoritized group or historically excluded group, then that means I automatically get it when it comes to everybody else and their traumas and their experiences. And I can say and do what I want because I've also experienced something. Or if you don't belong to one of those historically excluded groups, it's, well, I wasn't the part of the group who created this issue, so I'm not responsible for addressing it or dealing with those things, when in reality, we're sharing space with one another. A lot of how I see this, again, will come back to that idea of sharing and holding space, because you do not occupy the world alone. You do not exist in a vacuum. And because you don't exist in a vacuum, you are responsible for how you treat the people in your life. You're responsible for how you treat yourself. And in growing and learning more about that, 
that also should catalyze you to really think intentionally about what does this mean? But for a lot of people, because they have these thoughts around, I don't have much more to do or much more to grow in, or I am okay with everybody, they don't see their biases. They don't see how microaggressions and even macroaggressions show up and how they treat people. Um, one of the examples I usually use to explain to my students is when I was originally working at a university counseling center. And when I was trying to get into the office by using my hundred sets of keys, so I'm fumbling and fumbling, and I'm trying to figure out which one of these keys that all look exactly the same going to this very specific lock. And I'm trying to get them in and I'm dressed casually. Uh, don't let this fool you. I'm typically in sweatpants and a graphic t-shirt and, you know, I have a hat on my head. But in doing so, I didn't look like the person to other people who should be holding a set of keys to get me into an office. But eventually I figure out my key, I get into the space, and security walks up. And they say, well, how did you even get into the building? I said, well, I work here. I show them my ID. Right, but you don't look like you should be here. I said, well, what does someone who look like they should be here on a college campus of all places where people are dressed in a multitude of ways, where do I look like I should be? Oh, well, I just needed to check your ID and make sure that you weren't just trying to break in and steal things out of the counseling center. I don't know. So we have this exchange. I continue to my office. And then we have a set of students show up who are waiting for their appointment. At this point, I'm sitting in my office, placard right outside of the door. My door is cracked. And one walks in and says, I'm looking for um, Dr. Ellis Nelson. You must be the receptionist. Do you mind signing me in for my appointment? I said, well, I am Dr. Ellis Nelson. Feel free to call me Leela. I'm happy to get you acclimated, but just have a seat. Um, our executive assistant is out right now, but I will go ahead and get you checked in. This happens six more times throughout that day. And whenever I am in the office, whether I'm dressed professionally or dressed casually, I'm never assumed to be Dr. Ellis Nelson. I'm always assumed to be anything but. And that's where bias rolls in. Because of how I look, whether I'm dressed professionally or casually, but because I exist in this skin and I exist in this body, I'm never the doctor. When I'm thinking about pharmacists and pharmacies as a whole and what do the different types of employees who work in those spaces and what they could do to really ingrain cultural humility into their work, it often sends around being part of your community. I live in Beverly, which is a South Side neighborhood in Chicago, Illinois. When I go to pick up my prescriptions or I pick up my husband's prescriptions, most of the folks there look like me. So I have this automatic assumption that they just get it, right? It's part of that statement that, what do the kids say? The girls who get it, get it, and the girls who don't, don't. And that essentially means that when you see me, you likely not only see the person who's the patient coming up to grab their medication, but you likely see a history that comes with me as well. So you talk to me a little bit differently. We use more colloquialisms. I'm not talking the way I am now. This is me code switching in a sense, so that I can ensure that I'm being understood across a diverse spectrum of listening ears versus if I'm going up to the pharmacy and I'm like, all right, bet, I just need my meds. So let me know what else you need from me. Um, I'm straight. I'm good. You want me to do my tap? Do you want me to do cash? Just let me know what's good and what works for you. Versus, hi, I'm here to pick up my medication. Um, do you prefer that I use the swipe feature or my Apple Pay on my card? And if there's anything else that I need, I'll be sure to let you know. And no, I don't need to talk to the pharmacist. So there's a subtle difference in my level of communication. But the thing I love about my pharmacy is that they let me do that, and they never try to correct how I exist in that space, regardless of how I show up. But I have been in places where I've needed to go to the pharmacy, and I've had people say, you need to speak clearly, or I didn't understand that, or you need to speak standard English. What is standard English? There's nothing standard about how we speak in this country. We don't even have an official language in the United States. But because of the colloquialisms I use that are connected to my culture, I am intentional that when I am in spaces around people who look like me, I want them to also feel comfortable, whether they want to speak in Avi, which is African-American vernacular English, or they want to speak in a different way, that I will be able to hear and understand you in any way that you choose to show up. So as a pharmacist, show up for the community. But you also need to get to know your community, too. Don't just set up shop. 
and assume that it's all good. It's not all good. It's not Gucci. Just get to know the people. Go to the farmer's market. Go to the grocery store. Take part in community events. If you aren't noticing any events that really center around healthy communities and well-being spaces, create some. There's often funding and resources for that. Become part of the community. Get to know the people. Don't get to know them by patient ID. Get to know them by name. If you notice that someone has come up with a family member or a friend, introduce yourself to both of them. Likely because of experiences with medical trauma, often people of color will show up with grandma or mom or the cousin or the best friend because they need someone else there to bear witness for them. Or they may need someone to translate information. Treat both of them with dignity and respect. Ask them both what is needed and necessary to make that person feel comfortable. When thinking about cultural humility, at the intersection of person-centered care, we also can't leave out the team, the people that we work with, the folks that we spend the majority of our day around talking to, laughing with, essentially that water cooler moment, right? So when you're thinking about how do you ensure that you're continuing to make that meaning, you also need to get to know the people you work with. Again, you don't need to be besties. You don't need to throw everybody a birthday party. You don't need to know everybody's dog's birthday as well. You don't need to do all those pieces. But it is important for you to really think about how are you going to actually allow them to be their most authentic selves and for that authentic self to be represented and safe and supported in that space. And that's often what lacks in person-centered care. And it's also important to know that when we say person-centered care specifically, we mean I see you as an individual. I have all the capacity necessary to give you this unconditional positive regard. I see you with all of the dignity and respect that you're owed, and it's my responsibility to not only take care of you, but to also take care of you so that you can continue to do the things you need to do in the world around you as well. It all still centers around what you are willing to do, but the impact will be driven both on an individual level because your clients will be able to see that, the people in front of you will be able to see that, but also the community community will know and see and feel how you're showing up for them. And it also reverberates in the types of offerings you may do for them. They don't have a wellness clinic. Can you set one up? Sometimes you need to have an ask a pharmacist table where people can just come up and ask you all those questions that they were afraid to ask when they were standing in line and they knew that 20 people were behind them. Another piece to really consider is the folks that we hire in the space. So when we're looking at the company, there's this great TED Talk by Melody Dobson, who um, is a CEO and just this dynamo out in the world, right? In her TED Talk, it's called Color Brave, I believe. She says when she's asked by boards of trustees, do we hire the black person or the qualified person? She simply says yes, because the goal is to make sure that you're not only hiring the people who can do the work, who can be trained to do the work, but you're also hiring people that truly represent the community and the focus there. Does that mean that everybody in the place has to look and identify in the same way? Absolutely not. But if you're noticing that there is a significant difference in terms of who's doing the work and who's receiving the care, it's time to reconsider how we're making decisions when we're thinking about humility at the intersection of systemically where does our responsibility lie in the field of pharmacy. It's what is the company doing on its own level to make sure that it's also doing the work, not just in practice, but in policy. And how are we going to make meaningful change by just being more intentional about the way that we show up for the communities that we sit in? When you've had this opportunity to really know and ingrain yourself into the community, join some of those spaces where you know the community exists. Um, go to your local library, see what types of programs and services that they're offering, but also while you're there, do some research. Are there any things that you're noticing about a lack of equity in those spaces? Um, what do you know about the local community and government? So it's really this piece around taking this personal inventory, taking an opportunity to introduce yourself in a way that feels meaningful and salient to you, join the community in multiple ways, but then also take up ownership by taking some responsibility somewhere that makes sense for you to then say, I can hold this piece where, yes, we will table at every event that you have for this particular group so that we know that we're making that connection. If there is a vote for some 
something that's going to be unique or special, we will make sure that happens. So increasing your awareness and your education and understanding around restorative justice, equity, diversity, inclusion is important for pharmacists and all the people in our lives because it makes you a better version of yourself, which allows you to be the best version of you that can show up for other people in your life and in your space. But again, the overall goal is to make sure that we aren't causing more harm to communities that have already suffered significant amounts of it, but with the additional understanding that it's our responsibility to just continue to hold that space. And there's nothing that I've appreciated more than really getting to know the people that I'm around on a consistent basis and what's important to them, because then that has allowed me to live on through them authentically in all these spaces where I may never see all the rooms that they go to, but I know that there's this version of me that exists within them and there's version of me or them that I carry with myself. And I love every part of that because I get to represent all of us every time I open my mouth. And I know that in doing so, I am creating a world that is going to be safer for the eight-year-old version of me that needed it, but also for the five-year-old that lives in my home, but also for all the people, regardless of age, regardless of identity, who often just don't have that safety. The goal is to make sure that we can all be seen, heard, and honored at the intersection of our identities when we're accessing care, when we're accessing support. And I know that the work that you're embarking on is something that can be very difficult, but it's worth it. And you are more than worthy of leaning into the work because it lets you lean into yourself. Hello, my name is Terry Smith-Moore, and I'm the Vice President and Chief Strategy and Diversity Officer at the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy. Today, I will discuss with you the topic of building diversity in the pharmacy workforce. The pharmacy workforce is absolutely essential to our healthcare system and the delivery of person-centered care and to the achievement of optimal health for all people. To truly be effective, the pharmacy workforce needs to reflect the demographics of the communities it serves, as well as be prepared to address the needs and challenges within those communities, including health inequities, the social determinants of health, and the lack of cultural competency, sensitivity, and cultural humility. These needs and challenges have a better chance of being met when we take into account the diversity of the pharmacy workforce. Now, what does the pharmacy workforce look like? Well, not very diverse when you look at those data. These demographic trends show recently that the percentage of non-white licensed pharmacists increased from 14.9% in 2014 to 21% in 2019. Also, the percentage of black pharmacists increased from 2.3% to 4.9% during the same time period. When you look at pharmacy students, in 2022, of the 47,000 students enrolled in the PharmD degree program who actually reported race and ethnicity, there were 23% Asian, 10% Black or African American, 9.7% Hispanic or Latino, and a half percent collectively Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders, American Indians, and Alaskan Natives where 46% reported white. Now these data just represent the lack of diversity based on race and ethnicity. Other demographics, gender, age, background, are also factors to be aware of when we explore the diversity landscape. Diversity, again, as the big catch-all for a variety of differences is important. Why? Why is diversity in the pharmacy workforce essential? Well, diversity and inclusivity recognizes, honors, and celebrates the wide range of differences in the human population. It helps us ensure patients get culturally and linguistically appropriate care. 
health outcomes tend to be improved when pharmacists and patients have similar backgrounds and culture, better understanding of what patient needs. In the workplace, diversity in thinking, perspectives, and experience lead to more innovative solutions, a more inclusive environment, better organizational effectiveness. Underrepresentation of racial and ethnic populations in the pharmacy workforce can affect patient experiences and outcomes. Patients often feel discriminated against or wrongly judged by pharmacy personnel who don't look like them or when the social determinants of health are not factored in to the patient care, when diversity is not part of the mindset of those involved in providing health care. So how do we address the lack of diversity in the pharmacy workforce? Given that the pharmacy workforce lacks the range of diversity reflected in the populations the pharmacy profession serves, Let's talk about how we address this lack of diversity. We examine and revise policies and practices related to recruitment, enrollment, and retention of pharmacy learners into diverse backgrounds and cultures. We can expose individuals from diverse backgrounds to pharmacists who are similar to them, emphasizing the importance of serving communities that are of similar race, ethnicity, background, and culture. Also, we can ensure that the pharmacy workforce understands the importance of diversity and is prepared to include principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion in all aspects of the profession. The pharmacy workforce, including practitioners, educators, regulators, including state boards of pharmacy, students, researchers, technicians, staff, and other personnel that work in and for the pharmacy work for settings must become more intentional and committed to achieving health equity and being constantly educated on what knowledge and skills and attitudes are essential to achieving those goals. There are many avenues where more learning and understanding of diversity topics, such as diversity, inclusion, equity, anti-racism, accessibility, belonging, biases, microaggressions, discrimination, and this list of topics can go on and on but let's take a look at what is now included in the pharmacy curriculum today as one avenue for this learning. The current standards of the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education call for cultural sensitivity in the standard titled Approaches to Practice and Care. The standard says that students should be able to recognize social determinants of health to diminish disparities and inequities in access to quality care. Additionally, some curricula also include unconscious bias or social determinants of health, diversity in patient communications, these are things that are included in some of the curricula today. Additionally, some schools integrate social determinants of health in patient case studies. For example, they tend to include questions about access to food or transportation and housing when talking with patients, as these factors can impact medication use optimization. In patient simulations in the classroom, students actually practice asking social determinant of health questions as part of their consultations. Now beyond the classroom, even when it comes to some state boards of pharmacy, they are including requirements or expectations to help the healthcare workforce be better prepared to deal with health disparities and health inequities. For example, 
In Washington, D.C., the state board has a requirement for cultural competency, especially related to LBGTQ communities, that there are hours that pharmacists must have in the training for licensure renewal. And even in the state of Illinois, health professionals are required to have one or two hours of unconscious bias training in order to get their licenses renewed. What else then can we do to address the lack of diversity in the pharmacy workforce? Well, first, we have to be more intentional and committed to addressing this lack of diversity long term. As was mentioned before, the need to examine and revise policies and practices related to enrollment, in recruitment, and retention of pharmacy learners cannot be overemphasized. That is the beginning and the heart of our pharmacy workforce. Also, as mentioned before, it is so necessary to expose individuals from diverse backgrounds to pharmacists who are similar to them, emphasizing the importance of serving communities that are of similar race, ethnicity, and background. These are the factors that will help individuals decide that they want to be part of our pharmacy workforce. Then encouraging everyone, that's all of us, to embrace their role in the diversity solution. Some other things that we can do to address the lack of diversity in the pharmacy workforce is to continue putting emphasis on the importance of health equity, the need to address health disparities, to integrate cultural competence in our serving of patients, and to also provide ongoing training to the workforce on serving diverse patients. We need to advocate, advocate heavily and consistently to make sure that cultural competence is included because that enhances one's ability to understand a patient's perspective understand their beliefs and behaviors related to health care. Additionally, another thing we can do is empower pharmacists and student pharmacists to see how this enhances patient engagement and the focus on medication use, adherence, and leads to better outcomes and treatment outcomes. And finally, if we aim for increased diversity in our student population, our faculty and practitioner populations, as well as our leadership, this will definitely help move us towards having more diversity in the pharmacy workforce. One specific example of how the lack of diversity is being addressed comes from the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy. Here are some things that AACP is doing. One is ensuring that diversity, equity, and inclusion, anti-racism, accessibility, and belonging are topics that are integrated across the association strategic plan. Additionally, AACP identifies and works to meet the needs of its members, both institutional and individual, when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion topics. AACP also welcomes opportunities to collaborate and partner with other organizations and associations on projects, public statements, research, and support the efforts of other organizations. And there's also the offering of suggestions to ACPE on expanded inclusion of these diversity, equity, and inclusion topics in the accreditation standards. 
All other areas of the pharmacy workforce need to build strategies, goals, and objectives that address the need for more diversity in pharmacy. Bringing in more diverse students and helping them graduate prepared to serve diverse communities is essential. Each of us needs to be very intentional about our own views when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, anti-racism, belonging, and more. As pharmacists, we all need to embrace and see ourselves focusing more on the patient using the medication, engagement with that patient, in addition to the actual product. Filling and processing medication prescriptions is and continues to be an important role for pharmacists, but more engagement with individuals, embracing their differences, embracing diversity can only improve clinical outcomes. Now this is long-term, lifelong work and we cannot rest on checking off the box on our to-do list or counting people in a room as achievement of diversity goals. The patients we serve, the colleagues we work with, the students that we train, and again, let me repeat, the patients that we serve deserve the best when it comes to medication delivery and management of services and care that we provide. A diverse pharmacy workforce is truly an important part of our contribution to the overall healthcare system. Thank you for your time and attention. As we have learned, Racial and ethnic diversity in the pharmacy workforce benefits patients of all backgrounds. Of course, matching patients to a pharmacist with a similar racial ethnic background is not always possible. This is especially true because pharmacists in racial and ethnic minority groups underrepresent minoritized individuals in the general population. It is possible, however, for personnel to be cognizant and respectful of individuals' cultural uniqueness. Better outcomes start with the awareness and sincerity that pharmacy leaders, pharmacists, and pharmacy technicians bring to the practice. All pharmacy professionals have a role to play in providing culturally competent, person-centered care. Among all healthcare providers, pharmacists are perhaps best positioned to recognize and address factors such as social determinants of health that shape individuals' experience and may affect their medication therapy and health outcomes. Attention to such details may factor in the pharmacist's counseling and guidance that most benefits the individuals. Thank you for your attention to and your interest in this program. I hope you have gained some new insights and awareness about the significance of race and ethnicity in person-centered pharmacy care that you can use in your daily interactions with the people you serve in your practice. This program was created as part of a multi-organizational project funded by the Office of Minority Health of the United States Department of Health and Human Services.